good evening good afternoon a uh, very good morning to our esteemed guests uh thank you so much for joining us today uh, for another educational initiative of the i foundation as you all know cataract surgery is no longer considered as vision restorative but as vision enhancing it is not just what we do on the operation table but uh, so much we do perioperatively especially the biometry forms a extremely important component of our ultimate results when patients come today to expect emetropia not just for distance but for near and intermediate also with excellent quality of vision to take us through this we have none other than uh, professor Uh, professor Douglas Cock, who is a professor in Allen Mospicher and Law Chair in Ophthalmology from the Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. He's a past president of the American Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgery, as well as uh, American Ophthalmic Society and the International Intraocular Implant Club. He has over 200 peer-reviewed publications to his credit. He is the one who came up with the Baylor nomogram and has placed a significant role in our understanding of posterior corneal astigmatism and centroid SA. It might have been easier for me to leave out the awards that he has not got from the major societies. I think each and every society embellished themselves by recognizing Professor Koch. And uh, uh, I'm not going to go into the details of his awards and recognitions. They are too numerous for me to enumerate. Uh, the lecture today is going to be of 45 minutes duration, but it's going to be followed up with a question answer session of 45 minutes. Basically, I gave enough emphasis for the question answer session simply because of my earlier experience when I interacted with uh, Dr. Doc. Uh, this was about three to four years back when centroid, um, Centroid SAA was just coming into O, and I was suddenly told but that instead of 0.47 doctors, I have to consider 0.1 doctors as my surgically induced astigmatism. I could not quite get it, but in one of those uh, um, symposia, I had a little time with him, and over a cup of coffee, we discussed. Just on a piece of paper and pen, he explained to me what exactly is meant by centroid SAA. And to this day, uh, whether in meetings or whether in conversation from what I read, I think my biggest understanding has been with this conversation with him. And that's the reason I, think, I thought we should utilize his expertise for clearing all our doubts. So just keep sending in your queries and at the end of the lecture, we'll take up all, all of them and try to answer them to the best of our abilities. As far as the topics are concerned, uh, Dr. Doc, Doc sent me this uh, snapshot of what he's going to cover. Sources are better uh, in today's biometry. How to minimize them? Update on the IOL formula that we are currently using. And the challenging guys, what exactly are the variations that we need to adapt? Limitations of current modalities of uh, IOL power calculation. And in case you do not have access to complement complex instrumentation, still how to optimize your outcomes. With these few words, I would like to welcome Dr. Douglas Koch and asking to take over. Welcome, Dr. Doug. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ramamurthy. I, it's really a pleasure and honor to be with you, and um, I'm very excited to give this talk to, uh, to so many of your colleagues in India. Uh, let's see if we can get that. Are you seeing my screen now acceptably? Very well. Okay, terrific. So, um, I, I want to. Do, I, I always like to point out that I, I work and consult with uh, some with Elcon, Carl's Ice, a, a, a lot with Johnson and Johnson Vision, um, which is a company I love, and a Perfect Lens. I think those are relevant to this talk. Uh, let's look at a, a typical case. Here's a patient of mine who the the target for the post-op refraction was minus 1.25 using the lens or the optical low coherence reflectometer. The corneal power is 44. The old Holiday 1 formula, which I still love, by the way, it predicted minus 1.26, and the patient ended up minus 1.25. Well, that's a really terrific result, as you might imagine. And why was the result perfect? Well, 
It could be that we are just so good at what we do, we measure perfectly, our formulas are perfect, that that's the reason. Or it could have been just good luck. Maybe there were two or more inaccuracies in either the measurements or the formula, and they simply offset each other. Uh, the third possibility was that the refraction was inaccurate, and in fact, the patient wasn't minus 1.25. And I, I think this case, just in the way I'm discussing it, shows that there's a lot of sources of error in what we do with IOL calculations. And one of the major themes in my practice and what I teach is that we have to be sure to let our patients know that we don't live in a perfect world, <clears throat> despite patients' high expectations. Here's a patient of mine, a 77-year-old uh, male who is a father of a prominent ophthalmologist in the United States, cataract surgery, the target was minus 0.2. The lens star in the IOL Master 700 gave identical readings, basically, and the patient ended up point, plus 0.62, so he ended up with a hyperopic error. And um, for this patient, who is a, uh, an engineer and highly technical, this was disturbing. Now, it's not a big error, but nevertheless, when you have full agreement with formulas and your biometers, it just shows that there are things we yet have yet to understand. Well, what can go wrong? Are the devices inaccurate? Uh, was it technical errors by my staff? The, are the formulas not perfect? Was the lens implant mislabeled? We do have a little variability in lens labeling. <clears throat> or is there some other unknown factor? Um, so in general, if you look at how well we do with IOL calculations in clinical practice and in the literature, we get about 80% of the eyes, at best, are accurate within a half diopter if predicted. Now, some of us are doing better than that with the newer formulas and the better biometers. But for more complex eyes, we certainly do worse. So um, Warren Hill, in his, when he first presented the RBF formula, reported that 91% of eyes were within a, within a half diopter if predicted in this range of axial lengths. And while that sounds very good, that also means that 1 in 11 eyes were off by more than a half diopter. And so that would mean one out of every 11 patients that walks in your office will be potentially disappointed uh, if you're doing as well as 91%. So what are the sources of error? There was a classic paper by Stecker Norby in 2008 in which he said effective lens position is 35% of the error, axial length is 27% of the error, and refraction is 17% of the error in, in understanding the accuracy of lens calculations. Well, times have changed because today, effective lens position still is a major source of error, but the cornea now has become an important source of error that we've recognized both anterior and posterior. And of course, refraction still remains an issue. <clears throat> so why has axial length been removed from this list? Well, of course, it's the superior accuracy of optical biometry. Um, and we now have uh, wonderful new devices for measuring that, that do great job, particularly the swept source, so these OCTs, but, but the others like the lens are, for axial length for measuring the cornea. And so remembering our patient again, since the patient measured essentially the same with both devices preoperatively and also postoperatively with one of them, the devices weren't the problem, and the technical errors were not the cause of this patient's error, even with this latest technology. Um, so we have these swept source OCT devices that are available to us, and um, they're more robust in measuring through dense cataracts, which is really one of the, I think, one nice features. So there are fewer times that we need to use ultrasound. Um, and, uh, and, and often the, we have the IOL Master 700, but it's true of all of these that they will measure through cataracts that the lens star is not able to measure through. Um, and we have criteria for validating, you know, the, the quality of the axial length measurements and other measurements. Um, we have to make sure that machine is in the right mode. Is it in the pseudophagic, the aphagic, the silicone eye well, the LASIK mode? Um, the axial length, you, we get a warning if the axial length varies by more than 0.2 millimeters between the two eyes. We look at the standard deviation for the axial lengths, and if it's less than, uh, we want it to be less than 0 0.2 millimeters. The anterior chamber depth, we look at that, it should be 2.5 to 4.5. Rarely will it get that, that deep, and rarely will it get that shallow. And the lens thickness should, again, be around 4 to 4, 5.5 millimeters.
investigators. And those are, those are, we have those posted on our machines <clears throat> so that our technicians can look at the measurement and validate them. So uh, I'm, I'm sure that some of you don't have optical biometry. You may use uh, uh, ultrasound. If you do, I would, pro I would recommend immersion ultrasound. And I think the question you have to ask is, what can you do, what do, you, have, can you do in your practices for using special IOLs? Can you use toric IOLs? Well, absolutely you can use toric IOLs. Um, it, you, you just need to get, I think, at least two sets of very consistent uh, corneal power or astigmatism readings from the cornea, and then you can use the best formula, such as the Barrett or the Abalafia Coke, and uh, you can get great results with torics. Um, can you use extended depth of focus or trifocal IOLs? Yes, you can, absolutely. Remembering that the accuracy of ultrasound is not going to be quite as good in some eyes as the optical biometry, I'm, I probably lean a little bit toward the extended depth of focus lenses because um, they're more forgiving for accuracy. They have what, what we call a large landing zone. You can be plus a half, minus a half, and patients will still get a wonderful result. Uh, we particularly like the symphony lens in that regard. Um, so uh, they're also t a little bit tolerant of cylinder when you use one of these extended depth of focus lenses. So I would say, yes, you can use these lenses with uh, uh, immersion ultrasound. Um, and uh, it just it requires a lot of thought about which ones. But, and, and I think you could also use trifocals. Um, but if you want to get started with it, a good place to start might be with the extended depth of focus. Well, how do we calculate IOL power? So we, we do our measurements. How do we calculate it? Well, the classic formulas are called virgins formulas. And virgins formulas, uh, this is the, the way they sort of all look. Um, and um, so um, you enter the, the target refraction. You uh, calculate the effective lens position using the separated. There's a separate formula in these formulas for calculating the effective lens position. You enter the, uh, the corneal power, the axial length, and you come up with the predicted IOL power. So I think that we have been talking about formulas in terms of generations. I think it's time to get rid of that terminology. I think we want to think about the formulas, the way they work, the way mechanistically they do the calculations. And so I would group them in this way, and this was a, uh, an editorial we wrote in Journal of Cataract Refractive Surgery in 2017. Those that are based on geometric optics, um, the Virgin's formula I just showed you, the Holiday 1, the Hoffer Q, the SRKT, and more importantly than some of the newer ones, the Higus, and especially the Barrett Universal 2 and the Holiday 2, and these vary by the number of variables that they use in their formula to calculate the effective lens position, whether it's two variables um, or whether it's five variables as for the Barrett or seven variables for the Holiday 2. There are ray tracing formulas, and the ones that are commercially available are the Olson's uh, Faco Optics and Oculus from Poisner, which uh, is rarely used because it's not very easy to, to implement with your biometers. Artificial intelligence formulas, well, we've heard a lot about the Hill RBF, which is a fantastic formula. And, um, and then the combination formulas, the, the, the Lada Super formula, the Kane, the Full Monty, that use a combination of virgins and um, probably artificial intelligence. And in fact, some of these formulas do that too. The Barrett has a little bit of artificial intelligence in it in the sense that it incorporates some regression data. So. Um, I, there's a sort of a blending of things, but the two major categories, and I think probably the two most popular form formulas today are the Hill RBF and the Barrett Universal 2. We still like the Holiday 2 in our practice, and we still like the Holiday 1, actually. So what's ideally the best formula? I think that in the future, ideally, ray tracing should be the best formula. Why? Because it incorporates all of the aberrations of the optical system in doing the calculations. It doesn't use an average value for the cornea, an average value for the lens implant. Um, it takes into account all the, the coma, the spherical aberration, et cetera, of the cornea, and it takes into account the shape of the intraocular lens, its asphericity of the front and back surfaces. Um, 
And I think that as part of ray tracing, we will be measuring the eye not as one length. We won't, we won't have a, a, an axial length measurement that is based on, on how fast the light passes from the front to the back for the whole eye, but we will measure each segment of the eye separately, and that can be done with our swept source OCT devices. And so we can do a customized measurement of the axial length. And we wrote a paper in ophthalmology that showed if you took the Barrett formula, which is look how accurate it is from 21 uh, millimeter eye up to 32. But if you, this is the, the Barrett, and if we segmented the axial length, in other words, used a different refractive index for each portion of the eye, we improve the, ac the accuracy at the extremes. And I think we'll see that kind of evolving as we proceed. But the, rate, the, the reason that ray tracing has not become more prevalent or more widely used is that it hasn't proven to be any better yet. Why not? Well, it still doesn't solve the problem of calculating the effective lens position. <clears throat> Remember, that's our major source of error. And um, so the outcomes to date are no better than our other formulas. Um, so, um, and remembering that all of these formulas in one way or the other are still struggling with what is the effective lens position. So let's kind of see, let's think about for a minute, can we do better in measuring the effective lens position? Um, there have been some really nice studies that have looked at using OCT preoperatively and intraoperatively uh, to improve ELP prediction. But none of the studies have shown that even if you improve the prediction a little bit, that you've improved uh, IOL calculation accuracy. And the challenging thing about effective lens position is that it's not, it's not constant postoperatively. In many patients, it changes. And there was a paper by uh, Hernshaw and Findel that showed in 17.6% of eyes, the anterior chamber depth shifted over a millimeter from one hour to three, two months. That means you can do the perfect calculation. And then as the eye heals, the effective lens position changes. And how many of us have seen patients come in who are 20, 20, one day post-op, and then uh, three weeks or four weeks post-operatively, they're minus one and very unhappy. That's because of this kind of problem. Um, eye well power labeling in the United States um, is, should be roughly within 0.3 diopters. Uh, I think the manufacturers actually do a, a much better job than that, but we have heard of mistakes of, of IOL labeling, so that's another source of error. But I think that's actually very minimal. Um, so let's, let's go back to my patient. Remember this patient was 0.8 diopters hyperopic from target. Uh, this is the topography. It's kind of unusual, isn't it? A little a flat area here, in the, um, and uh, this is the instantaneous curvature. The flat area, you can see the right eye, left eye, kind of curious. Um, it, um, it was uh, steeper than the, the readings from the biometers, so it actually measured a higher corneal power than the biometers. And because of that, if we had put the topographic value into the calculations, we would have had an even greater hyperopic error because since it was steeper, we would have picked a weaker IOL. So um, I don't have a solution for why my patient ended up 0 0.8 uh, diopters hyperopic. And I think that just goes to show there are things we just can't quite sort out in, these, in something. So let's, we talked kind of about normal eyes, or at least in general terms. Uh, where, where do we really need help? I think short eyes are a real challenge. And uh, by short eyes, I mean less than 22 millimeters. And certainly, once you get down to less than 20 millimeters. Um, when we published a paper that looked at the percentage of eyes within a half diopter for 20, less than 22 millimeters, and the Barrett actually was only less than 70%. The Hygus did the worst. <clears throat> Interesting, the Holiday 1 and the Holiday 2 did best. The Holiday 2 actually did the best, almost 78% within a half diopter. But those are not great results in, in very, very carefully measured patients. Uh, why is there poor outcome with short eyes? I think it's, again, the effective lens position problem. You've got a high-powered eye well and, a, and a, so that a small shift makes a big refractive change in a, in a, in a very small eye. And here's a, here's a case that uh, I had uh, six months ago. This lady, 69, she came in for cataract surgery. You can see she's a hyperope. Um, and um, topography looks a little unusual, um, nothing dramatic, uh, not much astigmatism. 
um, and uh, did the measurements on the right eye, and the anterior chamber depth was 2.38, and the lens thickness was 5.17. So she had a shallow anterior chamber and a very thick lens. And the calculations I did, both with the lens star and the IOL Master 700, all said basically put in a 28 diopter lens and should end up about Plano. And this is you, the, uh, the image from the IOL Master 700, the uh, A-scan. You can see the thick, very thick lens here in a shallow anterior chamber. So 28 diopters look like a, a, a good option. I've implanted it, and first day post-op, she was 2040. That's kind of puzzling. And at post-op week two, she called me and said, I can't see one very well. She was 2080, and her refraction was minus two and a quarter plus 2.25. And at post-op week four, it was pretty much constant. So there was an error of 2.12 diopters from predicted. Amazing and very frustrating to her and me. Postoperatively, then we took her to the Isle Master 700, measured the anterior chamber depth, and it was 3.63. And really, with a pseudophagy guy, it should be over four millimeters. So she had a, a 28 diopter. Remember the high power and shallow anterior chamber postoperatively. For some reason, here's the uh, again the Isle Master 700 image of the lens implant. You can see it's right up there against the iris. It was in the capsule. I did verify that it was well positioned, and there was no fluid behind the capsule. Um, so that uh, there wasn't a, pup uh, a capsule block causing the IOL to be displaced cent more anteriorly. So I did an IOL exchange. And if you do a simple calculation, you take the error and you merit, multiply it by 1.2, you get a 2.5 diopter change. Uh, the Barrett RX formula is excellent for this also, although I like this little rule of thumb, it seems to be very predictable. So I exchanged the lens for a 25.5, 2.5 diopter difference. And she ended up plus a quarter spherical equivalent, 2020. Very happy. Okay, problem solved. But now what do you do about the second eye? And guess what? The second eye also had a shallow anterior chamber, as you might expect, and a thick lens. <clears throat> so the rule that has been sort of taught in the literature based on a couple of studies, one of them from Thomas Olson, is that you should adjust for half of the prediction error of the first eye. So since she had two diopter error in the first eye, uh, I decided I would aim for one diopter of hyperopia, as you can see here, 0.94. And uh, thinking that I would probably, you know, end up pretty close to Plano, but if it worked exactly like the other eye, she'd be about minus one. So that's what I did, 27 diopters, and she ended up minus 150 or 1 1.6 spherical equivalent. Fortunately, she loves the fact she is now spectacle independent. So I was lucky, but um, again, she has a shallow anterior chamber postoperatively. Crazy result, um, but it goes to show that there are biological things that we can't predict. None of our best formulas uh, came even close to being accurate in this lady. Well, some good news, we're doing better with long eyes. And why are we doing better with long eyes? Well, I'll come to that. But the best formula is we, of course, develop the, the, the wine coke modification. Uh, we use it now for axial lengths of 26.5 and higher. And this is the formula. You multiply that by uh, 0.817. And you add 4.7 to that and then and reinsert it into the calculation. And when we did that, we got a database from Warren Hill of over 1,600 long eyes. And we had 93% with a half diopter. Uh, the Barrett Universal 2 does a great job now in long eyes, as does the Hill RBF2. So I think you have three good options for your longer eyes, and uh, that's really one of the most uh, happy areas of progress as far as I'm concerned in our, our IOL calculations over the last many years. And the reason we're doing better is because the IOL power is lower, so effective lens position has less impact on the outcome. If you take a four or five diopter IOL and move it a little bit one direction or the other, it doesn't change the uh, its uh, effective refractive power in the eye as much. What about the post-LASIK eye? Well, that remains a frustration to, I think, all of us. Um, we published a paper using uh, a number of methodologies um, but we found using the Avanti OCT, we had 68% within a half diopter, better than the Barrett, better than any of the other formulas, better than the Hygis. 
um, still only 92% uh, with an uh, within accuracy of a diopter. Uh, what about interoperative aberrometry? Well, um, there's one paper by uh, Nicole Fram and Sam Maskin and my colleague Lee Wong, 39 eyes, and they found that the aura had 74% within a half diopter, a little better than, than what I reported, we reported in our other study. But again, for them, the Avanti and the Hygus, there was no statistically significant difference among these three. So Aura came out looking pretty good. Um, we looked at this in our own data. Was the Aura, how did the Aura compare to our preoperative measurements? This is in uh, myopic PRK eyes. Um, and uh, we had 129 eyes. So we asked, was the Aura prediction equal to what we predicted with preoperatively. If it was, fine. We wanted to look at those where the aura differed from the pre-op. So we had 97 eyes. So was then the question is, was the chosen eye well changed from the pre-op eye well based on aura? So did we look at the aura and say, oh, we better change what we had picked? 57 eyes, we changed it. Was changing the eye well a better decision? Did we make a better, did we improve the accuracy by using the aura to change the eye well? And guess what? It was 50-50. <laughs> so aura, for us, changing it or not changing it didn't, it, it, we would have been as good just leaving aura out of the whole picture. Okay, so let's look at those where we did not change the eye well based on aura. We, we said, no, we're going to believe the pre-op measurements. What happened? Would aura have helped or hurt these results? It would have helped in 13 eyes, and it would have made results worse in 27 eyes. So um, at best, Aura would not have improved our results. Now, I, you need to understand something about the way we do things. I think you're probably getting an idea about this already. We're really picky about our pre-op measurements. We get a lot of measurements, including the Avanti OCT. And I do think that Aura is helpful for those who are using you know, very few preoperative measurements. It gives them another important way to measure the outcome. <clears throat> but it's still, it's just doing a measurement of a refraction of the eye and using a formula that it has to predict the effective lens position. So on an eye that's already been altered, where the cornea's been altered, so I think there's still concern about that. So I think for, for LASIK patients, get, get a lot of data and under promise, the reported accuracy is really less than 75% within a half diopter target with almost all studies. The LASIK-induced refractive change is helpful. Um, I think among our formulas, the Masket and the Barrett True K are among the best, but get lots of measurements. Remember, no formula is a guaranteed accuracy, and that's what we have to tell our patients. Okay, well, what about measuring the posterior cornea in our LASIK eyes? Will that improve our outcomes? Because if we measure the posterior corneal curvature, we can then get a better estimate of true total corneal power. And uh, Dr. Barrett uh, did a study uh, and has recently published it, but he's still got 70% within a half diopter using the IOL master with total keratometry, which is the <clears throat> measuring the front and the back. So our data also show slight improvement measuring the total corneal power. Uh, admittedly, this is in the early phases of things, but these, these eyes remain challenging. We need progress here. The other thing that's interesting about post-LASIK eyes is you've got to be careful not to make judgments on the first day postoperatively because post-LASIK eyes can flatten or certainly change, especially after hyperopic LASIK, early in the postoperative period following cataract surgery. That means that the vision on 2020 on day one can also worsen. So that's why you shouldn't necessarily celebrate on day one because you have to wait and let it heal. Here's an example of a patient of mine. The target was minus 1.5 prior hyperopic LASIK. She was 2040J4 one day postoperatively. Here's the pre-op map. Here's the one day post-op map. And you can see this flattening, which made the numbers are small, but it's a diopter in all these areas, or 0.7. The cornea was 25 microns thicker and 0.75 diopters flatter. And by week three, everything was back to what it was expected. The manifest refraction was minus two. I was off by a half diopter, but she was J1 and happy. Here's a patient I operated on Wednesday, um, just two days ago. And she had prior myopic LASIK that I had done. This is the uh, preoperative topography. And one day after cataract surgery, the cornea 
had minimal swelling. It was six microns thicker centrally. Um, but it was 0.4 diopters flatter. And this is the difference map in the blue areas and the areas of flattening here in the area of the incision, but also centrally. And the astigmatism changed from 0.33 at 112 to 0.68 at 84. So it's, these are moving targets until they settle and it takes a few weeks. And here's an incredible example. This was a patient who had presby LASIK in, done in, uh, in uh, Columbia. And um, the target for my, this lady's surgery was Plano. Um, and at one day post-op, she was 3.5 diopters hyperopic. And the central cornea had flattened by 2.7 diopters. That's the central cornea, 44.4, 41.7. Unbelievable. And by one, three weeks post-op, she was minus one. So, and that's really she, where she ended up. So I did not hit the target, but it, she did much better. What about toric eye wells and post-refractive eyes? We've uh, just published on that. And we think that they're, they're re very reasonable in post-refractive eyes. Um, and, and if you meet three criteria, you want a regular bow tie astigmatism within the central three millimeters, whether it's a myopic LASIK or a hyperopic LASIK. Um, you, want the, you want two different measurements. Ours was IL Master and Lenstar, but you want two measurements that are pretty consistent with the magnitude being within about three quarters of a diopter, as you see here, or, and the, the uh, astigmatism meridian being be in between two measurements being with less than 15 degrees. So three quarters of a diopter, 15 degrees, re fairly regular in the central three millimeters. And when you, um, then, then you're going to ask, well, what do you do about posterior corneal astigmatism? Because these post LASIK guys, we, we can't guess what the posterior cornea is by looking at the front because the front has been altered. Well, we, uh, we just, I just estimated 0.3 diopters against the rule spherical uh, or, or astigmatic effect, assuming the posterior cornea was probably steep vertically, as most are, and targeted a little bit with the rule. And we then, doing that, we found that we got really over 80% in myopic LASIK, 80% with myopic LASIK, 84% in hyperopic LASIK, and in post-RKIs, 76% within a half diopter. So I think, yes, you certainly can use toric IOLs in these complicated patients. What about keratoconus? That's a bigger challenge. Uh, here's a patient of mine, uh, a neighbor. He was minus 14 plus 3.25 at 119. Um, very steep. He's got his, his mean corneal power is, well, it's not super steep. He's 48. There's his astigmatism with the Almaster 500. This is the Galilei. Notice that the axes are pretty consistent. And we have three axes the same, the refraction, this, and this point to astigmatism. I, I was very conservative. I only picked a T5 to correct um, two doctors, targeting minus one. And the patient ended up hyperopic. Um, so I had a two diopter hyperopic error, and I undercorrected the astigmatism. He needed a T8. Now, this patient was ecstatic because this Plano plus 2.25 is a heck of a lot better than being minus 14, but obviously a problem. And if we look at our data, and our, my colleague Sumitra Candlewall has compiled these data from our center, from uh, Dr. Woolsey in Park City and, and Dr. Drs. Weber's and, and Neutz, in, in the Netherlands and Maastricht, the steeper the cornea, the greater the hyperopic error in the LASIK. So this is the mean keratometry, and this is the refractive prediction error. And you can see that the steeper the cornea, the greater the hyperopia. Pretty good prediction of Ks versus how you might adjust it up to about 50 diopters. And then after 50 diopters, the, the R squared of the anterior and the, and the prediction error, that's all over the place. So um, it's, these eyes are really, really tough. Now, it's interesting because we have some new formulas for eyes with keratoconus. There's the Kane formula and the Barrett formula. You'll see that on, on Barrett's uh, website, on the, uh, the uh, APASCRS website. So we'll be really excited to see how these perform. We don't have a lot of data on either of them so far because they're new, but I'm knowing both of these uh, uh, colleagues, I think we'll get some improved results. What about toric eye wells and keratoconus and RKIs? Well, I've talked about RKIs already.
But I think you can use toric eye wells and keratoconus eyes if they're stable. You've proven that. If the topography is pretty regular in the center, three millimeters, sound familiar, just like the post-LASIK eyes. They're not going to wear a contact lens. They're, they're telling you, I'm not going to wear a contact lens. And I like to look at the glasses in these patients because if the astigmatism correction in the glasses before the cataract was pretty much the same as what they had um, in their case, then I'm, I'm pretty, pretty comfortable using a toric lens. Um, corneal transplantation eyes also present challenges. Uh, patients after penetrating keratoplasty can have irregular anterior and posterior corneal astigmatism. Uh, you can use torics, but don't expect pretty you know, super results. Uh, if they've had DSEC, um, you know, we know, of course know about the posterior corneal steepening. You can use torics in these eyes. But again, you, you don't, unless you have a good measurement of the posterior corneal surface, you don't really know what's going on with the posterior cornea. DMEC, I think, is the most promising because well, there's some early data that suggests the posterior corneal astigmatism is not changed that much by DMEC. Um, and so you probably can consider using them in these DMEC eyes. Um, so that brings us back to really what we can control now when we're doing our lens calculations. We can talk about fancy formulas and expensive equipment, but let's get down to some basics. Uh, this is a patient of mine who came in for cataract surgery. You can see the K readings, 4334, two diopters at 174. So, you know, you're kind of getting ready to put in a toric lens in this patient. But the Iowa Master gave me no K readings. And you look at the Iowa Master, and here are the reflections of the 18 LEDs. And you'll notice there's a missing data point right here. There's no LED reflection. So am I going to do surgery based on that? Well, this patient had come to see me three months before. And with Galilei, the, the corneal power is 44.6. And there was essentially no astigmatism. Remember, it, whereas the lens star had said 43.34, so 1.246 diopter difference in power, and it said that it had two diopters of astigmatism instead of what I measured with the Galilei. So we looked at the lens star measurements as we looked at the IOL master. You can see same area, there's loss of data. Well, this patient was dry. So I treated his surface and brought him back six days later, and everything was now consistent. All the measurements lined up, and then with an EDOF, this patient got a symphony lens. He was 20-20 J2 and ecstatic. So this goes back to that that first our discussion, the corneal power is a major source of error. You need more than one measurement, and you've got to verify the quality of the data that you're getting from it, no matter whether it's Myers from a placido disc, or the, uh, whether it's the, the reflections of the LEDs, or even if you're using manual keratome, keratometry, looking at the keratometry Myers as you're doing it. Um, and so you can, you can evaluate the raw data with your devices, um, and you can also look at things like standard deviations, and Warren Hill has suggested that for the lens star at least, if you see a standard deviation of corneal power, either flat or steep of 0.3 diopters, or the steep meridian of 3.5 degrees or more, then you probably have some inaccuracy in your measurements. And uh, the standard deviation in the flat meridian for our patient was 0 0.418. So that should have rejected, we should have rejected that measurement without even uh, needing to look at the Myers, but of course you do as well. Um, so we've discussed that. Okay. There's another source of error that can occur. Here's a patient who, who was, we were looking at his cal calculations um, and uh, noticed the difference in axial length and the lens star gave us a warning. There's a significant difference. So check the value for outliers. Okay, well, um, and uh, Notice that the standard deviation for that axial length was 0 0.127. And remember, it was supposed to be no bigger than 0 0.02. So we looked at the measurements, and you can go in the lens and remove a measurement or two and, and actually reduce the standard deviation by doing that. But because you've got this one measurement here that's 26.85. Hmm, that's interesting a little closer to 27.03, but that would be the one you would remove in order to get rid of the, the uh, to reduce the standard deviation. So 
The Iowa Master 700 that day measured 26.93, very similar to the 27.03 of the other eye. Uh, and what happened? Well, we repeated the measurement of the lens star and got 26.91. And the problem was the optical head was too close to the eye. So that was a technician error that can be created with lens star that you, know, you need to, to be careful of. So there are other sources of measurement. And, and validating your data will, will save you from so much trouble. Um, it's, it's as important as everything else we do, if not more so. And I've already discussed with you our validation criteria. So I think now we're really reaching the point where we're getting close to a ceiling for accuracy where we can't be more accurate than, than, uh, than what we are with, with the most sophisticated things we have. So we need to educate our patients that our calculations can be erroneous and to address the post-operative errors, we need better ways than corneal refractive surgery and uh, IOL exchange. And that's where some of this uh, new technology uh, comes into play so that if you don't hit the target initially, uh, I think post-operative adjustments going to be interesting. We already have the RX site that induces a curve change. It's extremely expensive technology and takes up a lot of time. It's only going to be for very select practices. And then we have the perfect lens uh, and Clario, which are using refractive index shading of the IOL implanted in the eye. Um, they're very, the work that's being done is very early in stages, and we'll see how it turns out. Um, the results of one study reported by Briarly out of uh, Moorfields, looking at 34 eyes and 21 patients with prior LASIK or PRK. They did one, two, or three adjustments and two lock-in treatments. That means five visits potentially. It's a lot of time. We've got to charge the patient a lot of money to spend all that time. But they got the error down to 0 0.19 diopters. Amazingly good, amazingly accurate. 74% uh, within a quarter diopter, 97% within a half diopter. Really phenomenal accuracy. Um, and then this technology. Of uh, the perfect lens, uh, which is the company I've been working with, you can change the spherical power, the touristic, you can add or subtract multifocality. And here's just some laboratory work looking at high well power to begin with and the intended change and the actual change. You can see it's really very precise. The biggest error here was 0.8 diopters. Uh, one final thing I want to mention is, you know, we, we are really interested in our all we do to prevent errors. And prevention of errors will be increasingly important as everything else we do gets better. The, the worst thing that can happen is you make an error um, by not giving the patient the lens he or she wanted or by selecting the wrong lens. And um, so software is being developed to bring all our data together. One example is Veracity from Zeiss. Others are working on it. Um, the goal is to save time and eliminate errors. And um, Here's an example of some screens from the veracity where you can ask patient key questions about what target they want. Um, and do they have the use done monovision? What kind of complaints do they have? Do, are they willing to pay extra for special lens? Uh, you can, all the biometry is combined in, 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 in one sheet from different biometers. Here's the lens star, the IOM master, if you had an Argos, et cetera, ultrasound. Um, they give you alerts about allergies. Um, warnings, um, warnings about validating the keratometry. Remember I showed you the axial length differences in the lens star is brought up here. Um, and then you can plan your lens implant. Um, and then you can take that plan to the operating room. This is what you take to the operating room. And you can even look at your data post-operatively. So, and it also generates operative reports. So this kind of thing will incredibly improve efficiency once it gets improved and streamlined. So where are we in 2020? What are our best practices? Well, we want to use accurate devices. If you have access to optical biometry, it's, it's nice. It's not mandatory, but it would be ideal for all patients if we could do it. Uh, Multi-zone LEDs in our devices are excellent. I think I like having more than one ring. I think that improves the accuracy. We want to use the best formulas but we want to verify the quality of our data and more, most importantly, educate our patients about the fallibility of our calculations. So I'll close with that and uh, thank you for your attention and I'll stop sharing my screen and we can talk, take some questions.
Thank you so much, Dr. Kopp. It's a truly a very elaborate talk with so many wonderful examples. And there have been quite a few queries that have been coming up. And I think we'll have a busy time taking them up one by one. And uh, starting from the basics, when exactly do you think we should judge the refractive outcome of our uh, surgery in the sense that the example that you alluded to, the lady had a minus 2.25 at the third and fourth week on the first post-operative day, she was almost hemotropic. So when do you decide that this patient has an optimal or a suboptimal outcome? You know, I, I've seen patients change as, as late as three months. So I usually, if it's, if it's a refractive <coughs> spherical error, for example, they ended up minus one and they wanted Plano, I wouldn't do a LASIK or a PRK for about three months, just to be sure. I've seen some late changes. If it's a toric IOL that I clearly know is malpositioned, then I go in, um, I, actually, I actually go in the day after surgery at the slit lamp and try to rotate it back. But if it needs a further rotation, I'm going to wait a good three weeks so I, I think the astigmatism is settled. Um, the, uh, the RX site uh, technology, they're doing those patients at about two weeks postoperatively. I think that's a little early because the wounds and everything still can be changing, but uh, those patients have to wear sunglasses for the whole time. So it, I think it varies by the condition. But ideally, if I had my choice, I'd wait three months for everybody if the patient's willing, because I think then things you really know, things are secure. So the take-home would be that if it's a laser vision correction or something, it will be three months later. But if it's a rotation of the toric oil, which actually came up as one of the questions, it will be yes. about three weeks later. Yeah, two to three weeks, I think it'd be great. And, and as I said, I, could, I, I do them at the slit lamp um, very early. Um, I might be able to bring that up while you're bringing up questions. I can actually show an example of that. Mm -hmm. But go ahead, yes. Yeah, and uh, you did mention about the change of VLP uh, over the lifetime of a patient. So assuming that the surgery has gone off very well, the well-centered lexus with a 5.5 millimeter lexus overlapping the optics, Still, this could happen in a normal eyes, and uh, how long can this happen? I mean, can it happen over the years of the lifetime of the patient? It's something which occurs in the immediate post-op. You know, that's a really good question, and I don't think we know the answer to that. Um, the, uh, the, we know that we've all seen our patients, um, uh, you know, have changes uh, in their refraction over time, and I don't... I, frankly, I've not measured it to know whether that change over time is ELP-based or some other type of um, cause. Um, I, well, clearly, the cornea changes over time. It, it, we all know the astigmatism now goes from again, with the rule to against the rule. Corneal power can change, but we all see some refractive change in patients over time, and, and I think some of it must be ELP. I know when we have secondary cataract formation, uh, in the, in the eye well, that probably pushes the eye well forward a little bit and can induce a myopic change. But I've seen hyperopic changes too. So I don't have a good handle on that. Do you have any ideas? Not really. I mean, this is uh, you know, because we often end up telling the patients that you had good results and that's the way it's going to stay. But a couple of years later, sometimes they come up with a residual error. And, yeah. uh, you know, and it's not always in one direction. It could be a hypopia. It could be Myopia. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And I think I think it probably is ELP. And one of the reasons I don't do uh, immediate sequential bilateral cataract surgeries, I think uh, we get a lot of information from uh, the first eye to decide on the power of the lens to be implanted in the second eye, apart from all the calculations that we do. And uh, I know in the U.S. and even in India, is picking up the concept of doing both at the same time. Purely from the refractive outcome point of view, what's your take on this? I completely agree with you. Completely agree. I, I like to know, I mean, think, think of the problems that can occur in the, uh, in the early post-operative result. The patient may have a refractive error that's not expected. The patient may have negative dysphotopsia, and you may have to pick a different lens for the other eye or put the lens in front of the anterior capsule because of that. Uh, they may have positive dysphotopsia if you're putting in a, an extended depth of focus or a multifocal. I, it, if, if the patient is 
is going to wear glasses and they have health issues, I might do both eyes at the same time, but I've done that twice in my career. Uh, in my practice, I need to, my patients demand perfection. And so I think I can do a better job for them by deferring the second eye until I know more from the first eye. And I tell them that. I'm so glad that uh, you can cover my views because I think it's not errors in biometry because hematropia is not always the uh, right outcome for a patient. So you might hit, hit the target the first eye. You might have to adjust the power in the second eye depending upon the level. Exactly. Of the yes. And uh, you did uh, talk about the limits of uh, tolerance of the intraocular lens protection, etc. But uh, how important do you think is to have lenses of 0.25 diopter jumps? I mean, right now it's mostly 0.5 diopters. Or you think since there's a tolerance itself is about 0.3 diopters, and uh, again, the, what we can refract down is also limited. Do you think 0.5 is uh, good enough? I think 0.5 is good enough if the IOLs are labeled accurately. I would love it if they would actually tell me the actual power of the IOL. Then you could give me 0.5. Then if, if I had a stack of 20 diopter lenses and one of them ended up being 19.8 and one of them was 20.2, for my particular patient, I'd pick maybe the 19.8. So to me, accurate labeling would be much more beneficial than worrying about those quarter diopter steps. I think one of the IOL companies tried to do it, but maybe the platform was not right. It was hydrophilic acrylic because of which uh, the results were not as great as uh, what was expected. I completely agree. In fact, I found the results were actually poorer than expected because there was so much capsular reaction to the lens, it would push it forward or it was unpredictable ELP. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, you know, this also brings me to another question. You know, we keep talking about historic intraoc lenses. Uh, uh, very often the pupils come down and the markings are right in the periphery. You are an advisor to so many good companies. Why is it that none of them have thought about bringing the markings more centrally? You know, will it affect the quality of vision because that would make life so much easier since products have been adapted so much? You would think they could put just some little subtle line or something on the lens a little more central. I agree. Um, I'm sure they're worried that patients, that doctors will say you're going to interfere with the optical quality. So, yeah. Okay. Good point. What are your limits as far as uh, multifocal intraocular lenses are concerned? I mean, uh, as far as angle alpha is concerned and uh, value of the higher order aberrations, uh, well, that, yeah. that you will refuse doing it. I look at the corneal power within the central three to four millimeters. And if going across one meridian, there's a variation of more than a diopter, I am not going to use a trifocal or a multifocal. I might use an EDOF. I'm comfortable with the symphony lens in those patients. Um, I, uh, and in terms of overall, um, let me see, what was the fir first part of your question? Uh, oh, angle alpha, yes. Angle alpha, you know, it's an interesting story about angle alpha. I don't know what to make of it. Um, I don't know how important it really is. And uh, I look at it, but I have never had a patient with a problem that I can tie into angle alpha. And uh, the company Optical Express in the United Kingdom uh, looked at their data of IOL exchanges of multifocal IOLs, and they looked at the angle alpha in the patients who got exchanges and those who didn't, and there was no difference. So they did not find that angle alpha was a factor that contributed to patient dissatisfaction. Uh, so I'm not, just not sure. Would you have thoughts on that? I think it's an extremely important uh, take because, you know, the general belief is if angle alpha is above 0.5 millimeters, then you try to stay away from multifocal intraoculates. But I myself have found that, you know, there's no correlation between patient satisfaction and angle alpha. Uh, just as a Biomedia have made it 0.7 millimeters, but often I have thought that uh, even though logically it should uh, correlate with angle alpha, the patient satisfaction levels because the optical center of the uh, lens that you are implanting and the vertex of the cornea may not coincide. So it still it doesn't seem to clinically they don't seem to correlate. I, I believe that uh, uh, angle alpha is given more importance than it's due. 
Yeah, and, and just for our viewers, just to remind them, angle alpha is the distance between the corneal light reflex and the anatomical center of the cornea. And since the anatomical center of the cornea is further away from the light reflex, the thought is the lens implant would be decentered relative to the corneal light reflex. Yep, I agree with you. And, I'm uh, glad to hear you say that. <laughs> what about the hydro vibrations? I mean, uh, is there any cutoff value that you have? Uh, uh, you know, I don't. I, I actually I don't look at higher order aberrations. I just look at corneal power in the center, and I look at the average corneal powers. Um, like I said, across one meridian to the other. I'm pretty conservative, I will tell you, with post-LASIK guys. Um, I, I, I just don't, I don't use trifocals in those patients. Um, I, I really, if their cornea is fairly uniform in the central three, four millimeters, I'm very comfortable with EDOF lenses. I've been using a lot of symphony lenses in them with very good results. And I, it actually adds an, a benefit because the symphony lens and other EDOF lenses have a, a larger landing zone, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, the refraction, the power doesn't change so quickly. And so you can be off a little bit in one direction or the other and still get good distance vision. Since you mentioned the symphony, I mean, even in India, there have been wide usage of this lens. But then most often we end up doing a little bit of uh, uh, micro monovision for the second night mini monovision because uh, we find that it's not quite adequate for near vision and a uh, uh, little tweaking is necessary. But otherwise, quality of vision-wise, it seems to work quite well. Yeah, I agree. Uh, it, you know, um, I, I've used it in a lot of patients. I, I put symphony lenses in my sister. <laughs> um, the only downside, the only negative about mini monovision is that the myopic eye will get a little more glare. And if, if someone is driving a lot at night, uh, I've had some complaints about that. And of course, well, you can correct that by just putting on glasses. So sometimes those patients need glasses for driving at night to eliminate the myopia and reduce the glare. Uh, and you know, most of our people who have tuned in are clinicians. And uh, in a busy clinical practice, what do you think could be the percentage of cases they should expect to achieve for, uh, less than uh, 0.5 doctors of spherical equivalent, a residual error, because uh, Dr. Barrett talks about 90%, many others talk about 70%. With the current uh, level of our understanding, the kind of biometry equipment that we have and the formula, what do you think the person should consider as the benchmark that they should look at? Uh, you know, I think everybody should, should aim for 80, and those practices who have maybe better biometers uh, should look at 90, try to target 90. Um, but in a busy practice, your point's a very good one. It, 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 it takes a lot of time thinking through the calculations to get there. And that's a real challenge for, in a busy practice. And uh, do you think a constant optimization is still valid in today's world? I don't, I don't do that anymore. Yeah. Um, I, I stopped uh, because the a constants have been verified with hundreds of other eyes. And I think if you get a different A constant than somebody else, it may just be that your lane length is not the same. Our lanes are kind of short. So if a patient is Plano in my lane, they're, they're actually in, at infinity. They're about minus 0.2. So I take that into account. So I, I have stopped optimizing my A constants. And uh, when you're using the IOL master, you use the ULIP constants, uh, what's given on the uh, Yes, uh-huh. Well, we have optimized our constants along the way, and they're a little different than the ULIB. And so we go with the ones we've, we've had, but we don't, we don't go back every year and, and reevaluate them. Okay. So. And uh, you know, uh, I learned from you the concept of a centroid value of surgically induced astigmatism, and I uh, feed in point one. Uh, but still I hear of uh, surgeons here as well as elsewhere who use 3.3.4. Etc. Could you just elaborate a little bit more on why for a sub 2.4 millimeter, 2.5 millimeter temporal clear corneal, it's 0.1 is a right measurement as far as the surgically induced yeah. systematism is concerned? Yeah, I'm going to share my screen if I could. Um, and I'll show you an example of that. Um, let's go here. So here's an example. 
um, how I calculated my surgically induced astigmatism. Um, when I looked at my surgically induced astigmatism with, with vector analysis, the, the average length of the vectors was 0.4 with a range of up to 0.8. And this is what it looked like. Now, this is a double angle plot. So for those of you who aren't familiar with it, I hope you start to get familiar with it because I think it's the best way to analyze astigmatism. These are the against the rule eyes. These are the with the rule eyes. And you can see that with a, an incision that's made at 2.4 millimeters, um, centered right about 105, um, look at the scatter of the data. Here, here, here. It's all over the place. So if you average the magnitude of each one of these, the length of those, you get 0.39. But the center average, the central vector average, which is called the centroid, <coughs> is 0 0.07 diopters. So we have traditionally said, okay, uh, this patient had 0.5 diopters of surgically induced, this one had 0.4, this one had 0.3, therefore the average must be 0.4. But if they're going in different directions, then you can't use that. You have to, use the, have to take into account the magnitude. And so the, the mean surgically induced astigmatism, I think for most of us, is very low, even though the scatter is large. Now the, you have to ask the question, what's the scatter about? Is the scatter due to, um, really, am I inducing all this astigmatism? Or is it that the patients have been using too many uh, you know, drops with preservatives or something, and their corneas are dry, and I'm getting a bad measurement? We don't know. But give, be that as it may, the mean value is very small. And if you put a larger value in your toric calculators, now, this assumes it's a temporal incision. If you're operating superiorly, you're going to induce more astigmatism. But for temporally, I think it's about 0.1. Does that yeah. help? Yeah. Uh, the other factor I want to bring in was that you know, this uh, concept of posterior corneal astigmatism is good to understand that, good to understand its importance. But most of my colleagues would just send their uh, uh, measurements across to the company and uh, place the lens, the intraocular lens given to them, and the toricity determined by them. And I believe that, uh, you know, whether it's Alcon or Johnson & Johnson, Zeiss, or even many of the Indian companies have a robust formula for calculating the, which incorporates the posterior corneal astigmatism. So for a clinical practice, uh, we must understand the concept of PCA. Is it okay for them to just send in a, a repeatable measurements on and then go by what the company gives them? Or is it important that they themselves uh, validate the, uh, the intraocular lens power that needs to be placed? Uh, I, I'm, I think you just have to ask the company, what formulas are you using? And I think um, the, the ones that I would find very acceptable, uh, um, Alcon uses the Barrett formula. Uh, Johnson & Johnson uses a, their own formula that I helped them develop, which is very accurate. It was just as accurate as the Barrett. Um, some companies now are using the Abalafia Coke, again, which is equally accurate. So I think you just need to ask them what they're doing. And once you know that they're using the correct formulas, uh, I, I would feel comfortable with that because the companies have a, vers a vested interest in you're getting a good outcome or you're going to start using somebody else's lenses. <laughs> and this is a question from a colleague of mine who does a lot of take and talk lenses. He says, we talk so much about posterior corneal astigmatism, SIA, etc. But when it comes to fake lenses, there's hardly any chatter about that. How is it that uh, where refractive accuracy again matters a lot? Why is it that uh, uh, we don't well, seem to take that into consideration? Yeah, you know, for, remember for fake lenses, we determine a lot of what we do based on the refraction. So for fake lenses, we, we use the refraction and then we just use the anterior chamber depth to predict where the lens is going to go. And the refraction already takes into account the posterior corneal astigmatism. Right. And, uh, you know, oftentimes during your talk, you mentioned about uh, cross-checking in more than one instrument and uh, making sure that they line up. But uh, sometimes it was because of the dryness of the cornea, etc. Many of us don't have access to multiple equipments. And uh, uh, sometimes I find that confusing also when two measurements show up, I do not know which one to select. Of course, uh, um, there are some who believe uh, for going ahead with three instruments and going ahead with the measurement given by the median measurement. But then uh, uh, 
how exactly do you uh, handle this when two instruments show up, fairly different measurements? Well, yeah, that's a really good question. And the way I handle that is um, I like to, uh, if I have two measurements that differ, I try to look at the, at the validate the, the accuracy of them and um, by looking at the data. And if they do differ, then I'll, I might remeasure the patient again. And, and I would say to those people who have only one device, um, I understand that you can't, many practices can't afford to have two devices. So another way to solve the problem or at least reduce problems is to measure the patient two different times. Measure the patient when they first come in and then measure the patients, you know, uh, for a second visit or, you know, measure them 30 minutes later after they sat in the waiting room and had their eyes closed so their corneas are nice and moist. There are other ways to get around the problem of not having more than one instrument. I think the key to me is two good measurements. And if there's a lot of difference between the two and I can't somehow make them match, I will simply tell the patient, the numbers are not consistent. I don't want to put a toric lens in. We'll deal with your astigmatism postoperatively when I can do a good refraction and truly know what your astigmatism is. So your uh, recommendation is that every patient should undergo two measurements at different points of time and they should line up? Yeah, either two, two measurements on the same day with two different devices or just spread them out with the same device. Great. And you know, uh, some of us don't have optical biometers and uh, topographers, etc. And the immersion A scan and uh, good uh, manual bio, um, characterometry is what's being done. And we have the APACRS, ACRS websites where the uh, Barrett formula are available. And they still go ahead and implant uh, multifocals and torix. You did allude to this and you said that's, uh, that's absolutely fine with uh, reasonably good results. Uh, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, I think it's very reasonable to do that. Um, uh, you know, I, as I said in my talk, I, I think that the value of ultrasound biometry can be very good, can be very accurate. It, it's, it's a little more inclined to be inaccurate, particularly in long eyes, because you might miss the staphyloma. And so I, I suggested that if people are, a good place to start is using EDOF lenses, use a symphony lens, um, because then you have... Um, you know, you have a bigger landing zone, you're more likely to be accurate, you're going to give your patient at least very good distance vision and some extended range of vision. And that to me is, is a very nice place to start. You have to teach patients about the fact that they may not have reading vision, but that would be a good way to start. And if you're really, really good with your ultrasound, you're probably almost as good as with, with optical biometry. It just depends on the quality of who's doing the ultrasound, how attentive and how sharp they are. Perfect, perfect. And uh, regarding the um, IOL Master 700 itself, we have been using the Barrett TK formula, but we find that uh, the original Barrett formula, the Barrett Universal 2, the measurements that uh, they gave were almost always coincide with what we get with Barrett TK. And uh, do you think it's really important to measure the posterior coronary curvature rather than, um, you know, based on the mathematical measurements? what's given by, assume by the Barrett or your formula? As far as I can tell, um, I'm not seeing a big benefit of measuring. I, I agree with you that the measurements are almost identical. Um, so uh, I'm not sure whether that just means that um, the posterior corneal measurements aren't precise enough or I, I don't know what that's about. Barrett reports slightly better results using measuring the total corneal power, but minimal. And he's not even using the total corneal power um, as the sole measurement for his, he's, he's, he's put in other factors. And I think he's put in other factors because we know there are other things that affect postoperative astigmatism like lens tilt. Lens tilt creates a little against the rule effect. So we, we can't, the, the IO Master 700 me measures it, but we can't, the, we, we don't have access to those measurements now. But I think in the future, that'll be another factor that's added to our calculations. Uh, since you brought it up, I mean, uh, I know the lens, the original lens as well as the slow lens is slightly tilted forward nasally. So how much of an impact it has as far as the correction of uh, toricity is concerned in a normal eye? If the, the normal crystalline lens and the normal postoperative IOL is about four to five degrees of tilt, 
and that induces only about a tenth of a diopter. But we've seen ice with 9 or 10 degrees of tilt, and that can induce as much as 0.6 diopters. So there, I'm sure that some of these odd results that we see are due to the fact that tilt is either less or more than we expected. So is there any way to measure this and incorporate it in your calculations? No. <laughs> I mean, the, answer, the, huh? the, it's, those data are, are in the IWEL Master 700, but they have yet to provide them to us. We, 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 did a, we published a paper, uh, two papers on this, and what we found, um, we had to send the data back to Zeiss for them to do the analysis. So it's just not available yet. It'll be available one day. And uh, how comfortable are you doing uh, laser vision correction for residual diffraction? As you mentioned, that you do it about three months later. And if you have a multifocal uh, lens implant inside and you create a multifocal cornea subsequent to your laser, do you think the quality of vision would be impacted? Well, you know, hopefully we're not correcting much refractive error. We may be correcting a diopter, in which case I don't think we make much of a multifocal cornea. If I had to correct three diopters, I'm certainly going to exchange the lens. And if you want to see that, I have a little short video about uh, rotating the eye well on one day postoperatively I can show. Sure. Yeah, I think that might be kind of interesting for people to see. You, you look at the stick lamp? Uh-huh. So let me uh, so here's a patient who is who was her preoperative refraction you can see here was uh, let's see let's go back here was plus four and a quarter plus 175 and I put a ZCT 300 targeting distance and one day postoperatively I expected her to be better but she was only 2040 and it turned out the IOL was at 125 instead of 90. So what I did is you, I set the slit beam to my target of 90 degrees and, um, and then went in with a 30 gauge needle and made a separate little puncture after putting povidone iodine on the eye and antibiotic on the eye. And you can actually go in and rotate the IOL. Um, you can't see me rotating it, but you can see the movements here. And you can just drag the needle over the edge of the periphery of the IOL to rotate it. And um, terrific patient. Notice how steady she is. Unbelievable. I think it's a terrific patient and terrific surgeon. But would you recommend it normally? I, 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 think it's, I think it's very doable, yeah. You know, um, so this patient saw my partner the next day, and this is what she, then, then I stopped after nine. This is what she sent to me. She, she sent me this text. I don't know if you can hear it. Maybe this morning. Wahoo! All good. Dr. White, it was great. Thank you so much. Have a great week. A satisfied patient. <laughs> so you know, it's, I, I think people can do it. I mean, we do a lot of things at the slit lamp. It's just it's actually easier than it looks. It's kind of terrifying, but you know, the nice thing is, if you fix it one day postoperatively like that, if it happens to be not in the right position, the patient really forgets later on that they were even blurry. You know, they, 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 their memory is their vision's great from right, almost right from the beginning. It's kind of a nice way to handle it. This uh, repushing on the slit lamp is possible on the first post-operative day, or you do it even three weeks later? I've not tried it later. I've only done it at, th at, at, at one day. <laughs> I, I haven't had the courage. I would be afraid I'd have to put push too much force at three weeks. So I think uh, because of the earlier discussion we had, you don't believe in opposite clear corneal incision or incision on axis now because that. The astigmatism induced by these incisions is very minimal. I would be okay with opposite clear corneal incisions if you, as long as you keep your your wound right at. at I think if you do, you make a nasal and temporal, you can probably get about 0.3 or 0.4 diopters, maybe maybe 0.5 because you have two incisions. But I don't I don't agree with the idea of rotating your incision because you get a different surgically induced astigmatism depending upon where your wound is. You get more if you put your wound vertically, 
and you get less if you put it temporally. So I think I like to have my, my surgically induced astigmatism be almost nothing, and then I can decide what I need to do with relaxing incisions or toric eye wells. So we have quite a few questions that have come up, and uh, one of them is uh, from Vishaka Patnam. When measured posterior corneal astigmatism is less than 0.3, say 0.19, then which calculation to take measured PC or predicted value for toric eye wells calculation? You know, we have yet to see data that convincingly show that measuring the posterior cornea is any better than the formulas that take it into account. So I look at the posterior corneal measurement I get with my devices, but quite honestly, I'm very comfortable using the Abelafia Coke or my Baylor Nomram, and I, my results tend to be very excellent that way. So that's a good question. I just don't think we know yet what to do with the posterior corneal measurements. Remember, our toric formulas take into account what happened between pre-op and post-op. So they take into account more than the posterior cornea. They take into account the lens tilt in a way. And I think they're probably as accurate, if not more so. This question is from Kuala Lumpur. The doctor is asking. Uh, he consistently finds that he lands at better refractive outcomes with lens X compared to lens Y. He says, why is it so? Is it because of better lens labeling with one company? Um, that's interesting. It's either be better lens labeling, or maybe it is the way the lens is designed. That maybe uh, I think lenses that have a very steep haptic sometimes are a little more prone to a shift postoperatively. Um, and it, it also depends on the biomaterial. You mentioned, importantly, that hydrophilic lenses seem to, seem to sometimes generate more of a refraction in the eye. So I think that it's, there could be multiple things. It would certainly make me want to stay with lens, lens X. <laughs> yeah. And uh, this question is from Closer Home from Lake City, Florida. This person is asking, uh, is not... Serena, uh, if, you had, if you had to choose between IOL Master 700 and LensStar as your only monitor, which one do you prefer? Difficult question? Uh, I would go with the IOL I would go with swept source OCT devices in general and like the IOL Master 700, um, only because they measure through much denser cataracts. And they're also much faster to use. You know, they're easier for your technician. Um, I, I think that's a better way to go. And it's not really because the posterior cornea direct measurement is possible. Yeah, well, I mean, that may end up being more important over time. But to me, it's the speed, um, the penetrating through denser lenses. You also get a little sampling of the fovea th um, through the IOMaster 700. It shows you if the fixation was good. I think it's a little bit more error proof. And Pan Shin Wei wants to know, how does symphony lens compare with the eye hands? Okay, so the eye hands is a really interesting lens. It's a, it's a monofocal that has a little subtle curvature change in the front that gives you extended focus. So it gives you about a half diopter. It will give you no halos. So th the beauty of the eye hands is you get a little more extended depth of focus without halos, and it's a wonderful lens. To, you, to do with monovision because you can do Plano and minus one and they'll get really probably pretty good monovision with that with, with essentially no halo effect. So it's a, it doesn't give you the, the range of, of vision that the symphony does. So it, it, you sort of have a sort of, you've got eye hands and then you've got something like a symphony and then you have trifocal that give you some more and more near vision. I think we also believe that eye hands is more of a replacement for a monofocal than for multifocality. The Absolutely. Sense, yeah, yeah, I, uh, yeah, completely agree. The monofocal plus, which gives you a little bit of intermediate vision, but if a patient is really looking for multifocality, maybe that's not the lens to go for. Yeah, absolutely agree. And Dr. Tamir is from my own hospital is asking, will the scatter in uh, surgically induced astigmatism account for the post-op unexpected residual astigmatism? Is it so significant? You did mention that sometimes the posterior corneal astigmatism is not confined to a specific number, but there could be a significant variation. Could be one, that be one of the reasons for residual astigmatism? Absolutely, especially if the posterior cornea, if we think the posterior cornea is aligned vertically and it's in fact steeper horizontally, then it actually is going to induce some with the rule astigmatism. So that, that's certainly a possibility. 
And Dr. Rangaraj wants to know, uh, we have nailed the axial length. Would you assume the K readings are the most important? I mean, that's the one which brings in the variability. I think you already alluded to in your talk. Yes. Yeah, I think especially with optical biometry, the error from axial length is very, very minimal now. The only difference, the only problem with axial length has been with long eyes because of the very long vitreous cavity, and that's created some false numbers, and that's why we did our Wang Coke modification. And the Barrett now has taken that into account, as has the Hill RBF. Dr. Uh, S.B. Patil wants to know, does capsule phimosis change the post-operative refractive error? It I certainly can. can. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It can, either way, it can go front or pull it back or push it forward. Yep. So which is worse, uh, having a capsule of phimosis or having a rexis which is not overlapping the lens at all? Uh, well, I think they're both, I would try to avoid both of them. You know, I, I don't like to have the rexis outside the optic of the eye well because the capsule can fuse there and cause fibrosis, and I think that can change effective lens position. So well, I always mark the cornea. I have 5.5 millimeter markers. I mark the cornea, and when I do that, almost every patient, the rexus overlies the optic. There's, uh, this question I think I've already answered. Uh, this from Pritesha. Does symphony suit more than other plus view of cutting IOLs in case of large angle copper? Uh, I think probably yes. Yep. Uh, is it because of the central disc being a little larger? Center's a little larger, and again, there's more uniformity of the refractive power, so that if they're, you know, uh, I, I don't know that for a fact, I haven't studied it, but it probably does. So, there's another question from Dr. Gopalakrishna, he says, uh, does the central thickness of intraocular lens make any impact on the ELP? Um, we don't know. No, nobody studied that. That's a great question. Um, we, we, you know, when we do lens calculations, we different different companies have different ways that they vary the front and back power. Um, you know, uh, some companies as the power increases, they change both the front and the back, and others will change the front more than the back or the back more than the front. So that's just not something that's been worked out. So, you know, the lens shape, it's, you know, the lower uh, power lenses which have a meniscus uh, design to biconvex. I mean, does it have an impact on the principal plane of the intraocular lens? Oh, absolutely. It does. And um, if you're changing the power of the lens and you have a single lens constant for them and the power changes the principal planes, then you're going to have a problem. And as you already mentioned, when you're talking about higher powered lenses, even little shift has a significant impact compared to the exactly. lower exactly. powered lenses where the right. ELP seems right. to have a little less. Absolutely right. Yep. And uh, there's another related uh, question from Dr. Manda Parinjipai. He wants to know, is there a difference in ELP amongst various lens designs between C-loop and Pray tablets? Um, the study that was done by Oliver Findel included two lens implants. It had the ZC boot and it had some Zeiss hydrophilics. They didn't compare the shift in ELP that took place postoperatively, but clearly you're going to get a different ELP with a different lens design depending upon the thickness of the lens and the way the haptics are positioned in the capsule. Uh, Dr. Shishti Raj wants to know which is the best angle suitable for glaucoma patients. Glaucoma patients, um, you know, that's an interesting question. I think, uh, from my perspective, glaucoma patients should, if they have any risk of having some central vision loss, which can occur early in glaucoma, then I would be more hesitant about trifocals. I'm, I'm more comfortable with a lens. Uh, if I'm going to do an extended depth of focus, or, or going to do something like that, I would, I'm much more comfortable with a symphony because the quality of vision is preserved with the symphony because they also treat chromatic aberration and spherical aberration. So it starts with a very high level of quality, and I think that that's safer for a glaucoma patient. I think uh, just to give an input, uh, um, in glaucoma there's already a loss of contrast sensitivity, and uh, any multifocal, whether it's a need of or a trifocal, always comes in with some loss of contrast, and we always buy 
uh, vision at all distances using the current CPATAS. So maybe using these lenses, especially in advanced case of glaucoma, is not a good idea. Oh, and in advanced case, I completely agree. Yeah. And I think as far as topic is are concerned, because you're, if you're doing a trabeclectomy and releasing the sutures, the astigmatism can shift quite a bit and it's a little unpredictable. So maybe just a good uh, simple hysteric single piece would be the way to go in most cases. I totally agree. Uh, my, my, my comments about glaucoma are patients who are at a very early stage and very well controlled with maybe one or two drops. Uh, but if they're going to need glaucoma surgery, to me, then that, that just rules them out for any of these considerations. That's a great point. Dr. Gopal Krishna wants to know, is Rex's size more critical in toric than in spherical monofocals? Well, you know, I think um, I'm not sure that it matters. I like having an overlap with toric lenses. I feel it makes them more stable. But, I mean, the truth of the matter is the current toric lenses now, the, the, the Johnson & Johnson C, ZCU models, and the, and the Alcon models are very stable rotationally, so I'm not sure Rexus affects that in a major way. It probably, if you had a, a little area of the Rexus that was asymmetric, you can see how it might it might torque the lens a little bit, so just cover the there edge of the, the optic. There was a significant study from Japan which showed that, you know, most of the rotation happens in the first one hour after the toric and clock lens is placed. So nowadays I used to make my patients just walk to the room and then like any other uh, not patch those eyes. But I have started uh, patching these eyes for at least a couple of hours, make them stay in bed and then subsequently see them and then discharge them. Uh, do you think that's a good idea? Do you uh, agree with the fact that there's a greater propensity for these toric and lenses to rotate in the first one hour and we should adapt some measures for this not to happen? That's a wonderful way to do it. What have you found when you see them two hours later? Uh, most often I find that, you know, the lenses are reasonably well aligned at that point of time. I was not having a great problem with the rotation of these lenses earlier also, but then I did believe uh, when I uh, went through this study and uh, uh, Dr. J. David Chang also alluded to this and I thought this first one hour is very critical. And that's the reason I think it's all, I'm a little more careful with my toric and torque lenses rather than with my spherical lenses uh, yeah. when it comes to the immediate post-operative uh, movement of the patient. And I practice this for a couple of hours. I've stopped, I, you know, I haven't seen a rotation in a long time now with, with both, uh, especially since Johnson & Johnson. I like the Johnson & Johnson toric. And when they went to the new model, the ZCU, I'm not seeing rotation, so I, I guess I'm not too worried about it. But I agree with you that if it's going to rotate, it's in the first hour. And to me, it's probably most likely to rotate in patients who have it aligned vertically and maybe with a large capsular bag. So, yeah. Dr. Terence from uh, Malaysia wants to know, for short eyes less than 22 millimeters, would it be more advantageous to implant an EDOF IOL? to anticipate the change in ELP? Uh, yeah, I think you could probably get yeah. some benefit from that because the accuracy is going to be poor. You might, again, have the larger landing zone. And uh, Mohan Rajan wants to know whether uh, certain IELTS are more prone to shifting rather than some others. I mean, is there any... I think we have... You know, Warren Hill thinks that the... He, he commented he thought the Alcon lenses were more stable. But I have not found that to be true. I, I'm very happy with the stability of my J&J &J lenses, so I'm not sure that there's a difference among the various eye wells. Yeah. Uh, but J&J uh, has recently roughened up their habits. Now, earlier they said that uh, right. there was a little greater propensity for those lenses to move compared to the competitor models. So they have, uh, those lenses have had to come to India, but I think uh, they have uh, uh, roughened up their haptics so that the more, uh, tendency for movement is less. Yeah, those are super stable in my experience. I love the love those lenses. Uh, well, Dr. Madhuri wants to know best formula to calculate the IOL in keratoconus. I think, well, we uh, don't know. You know, I think as I mentioned in my talk, um, I'm I'm going to be interested to see how the Kane and the Barrett perform. Of course, each of them says that their formula is the best, so we'll we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> they're both they both do great work, and I'm sure they're both a big help to us. So, 
So Ayan Mohanta wants to, he wants a single answer, you know, he wants to know which is the single most accurate formula in predicting ELP. You know, I think, I think the two most accurate formulas throughout the spectrum right now are the Barrett Universal 2 and the Hill RBF2, and there's soon going to be a Hill RBF3, which has uh, included uh, data from a lot of very short eyes. So I, I'm going to be very excited to see the LRBF3. That may end up be, proving to be the most accurate. We'll see. But, but the Barrett Universal 2 is spectacular. I mean, it's just – and I still like the Holiday 2. I think the Holiday 2 is good in very short eyes. I mean, 18 millimeter, 16 millimeter eyes, um, 15 millimeter eyes. I think the Holiday 2 is the most accurate. I found it to be much more accurate than the Barrett, the Hoffer, or any of the others that I've tried. You know, we have a busy, fairly busy practice, and it's sometimes, though I know there are positives for other formulae, by and large, we are stuck onto the Barrett uh, suitor formula, and, you know, uh, post-classic, whether it's uh, toric intraocular lenses or universal tube for all uh, um, uh, axial lens, it seemed to work reasonably well for us. I mean, there are occasional surprises. But by and large, even if we're in centers where we don't have access to an optical biometry, we go ahead and do an immersion A scan and a uh, manual characterometry and use the uh, APACRS or ACRS websites and uh, go with that. And uh, by and large, uh, our results have tightened up much better than what it was a few years earlier. I, c I completely agree. I think it's a great choice. If you're going to pick one formula, I can never argue with your picking the Barrett Universal too. And uh, you did uh, mention about it in passing, but uh, this is considered by some as something beyond what's available. Ellen Comeran wants to know, what's the role, role of super lattice formula? You know, that formula uses um, a lot of third generation formulas, and that it also does has a little element of artificial intelligence in it. I'm, I'm, to me, I, it doesn't, doesn't, I don't think I can compare to something like the Bear of the Hill RBF2. It may be it may be better, but I have not seen data, published data that tell me this is better or as good as the Barrett or the Hill. Uh, do you think uh, in the coming years, in the future, um, most of these formula will have some artificial intelligence incorporated them, and they will keep improving uh, depending on uh, the uh, outcomes that they have over the years? Oh, I think they already do. I think the Barrett already has some artificial intelligence in it. Um, yeah, there's going to be, people are going to be blending in various things. Absolutely. Uh, you'd be happy to know that Melin Pandey is listening in, and he has a quick, uh, quick query for you. Does the Bangkok modification of axial length work even uh, work even in most classic guys? No, that's a good question. Uh, greetings, Melin. I wish I was playing golf with you today. Um, uh, <laughs> 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 the uh, the the uh, Wang Coke should not be used in post LASIK eyes because all of the formulas for post LASIK eyes were made with the original axial length as measured. So you don't want to implement that in post LASIK eyes. Uh, I hope uh, we have a few more questions to run through. Is it okay with you? I mean, we are almost coming to the end of our time. Yeah, I can take a. I have another five or ten minutes. Sure. Okay, great. Uh, Dr. Sujata Mohan from Chennai wants to know what would be the best time to do a IOL exchange? Well, it depends what you're exchanging it for. If you're exchanging it because the patient is unhappy from negative dysphotopsia um, or from glare with a multifocal or, or a symphony, then I would wait a good three months because they often adapt to it. If they're exchanging the lens because the power is obviously very off, you know, they're minus three and you expected minus one or whatever, then I would probably do it at about two weeks, two or three weeks. Give them maybe three weeks just so I know that they've settled. They may be a little additional settling, but you're, you're correcting such a huge amount that you, you can't leave the patient at my, you know, with a huge unanticipated error for many, many weeks. When the error, the residual error is almost in the range of minus three diopters or plus three diopters, uh, is there any point in even waiting for three weeks? In those cases, I would even go the next post-op and go ahead and exchange. Well, you know, 
Yeah, if it's that much, you could argue that's a great plan because that just gets rid of the patient's problem right away. I think if, I haven't had a minus three error or a plus three error in a long time, but I agree with you. I think if that magnitude, I'd, I'd do it right away. Right. And Dr. Karthik Sriprakash wants to know, would you recommend a preoperative topography for patients with any amount of cylinder? Well, I get a pre-op topography on every single patient that I do surgery on just so I, I can know what the topography looks like. If there's form frust keratoconus, um, and I also use the Myers from the Placido disc to look at the surface quality. So I get topographies on everybody. I think it's it's a good thing to do. I will point out the uh, the Iowa Master 700 has, uh, now has a new, new uh, technology called central topography where they use the three rings, um, and we help them develop a color scale, and uh, it actually gives you a lot of information. It's kind of remarkable how much information you get from those three rings. Um, but, and that may be a nice solution for some people who, if they need a new biometer topographer, maybe they can just get the, the 700. But uh, to me, topography is essential in I, my practice. So IELT Master 700 with the topography has become commercially available now? It's not yet come to India. Uh, it's uh, been released in the United States just recently. Okay. okay. But uh, I think they're charging people, uh, you know, some, uh, 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 they're charging for the upgrade. So I. Oh, your you best I will master something that can be upgraded with that. Yeah. Right. And which is the IOL of choice in eyes with post classic? Dr. Tanvi wants to know. The IOL of choice? Yeah. Um, you know, I. Uh, if it's post myopic LASIK, I like the the Johnson and Johnson, or you can use the Alcon, something that has negative spherical aberration to compensate for the positive spherical aberration. We looked at post hyperopic LASIK eyes. We published a paper, and the 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 corneal spherical aberration in post hyperopic LASIK eyes ranges all the way from still some positive spherical aberration to some minus. The average was zero, so. I just, in, in post hyperopic LASIK guys, I put in lenses with zero spherical aberration because I want to have uniform power over the center, over the IOL, because the, the center apex of that LASIK may not be centered with the IOL. And if the IOL has uniform power, I think you get better quality of vision. Great. I mean, so I would use something like the Bausch and Lomb MX 60E or maybe the Zeiss lens or other lenses that have zero spherical aberration in a patient who doesn't have, uh, who's had hyperopic LASIK. That's a little different from what we normally do in the sense that, uh, because post hyperopic LASIK, they have a hyperpolyconia. I go on to a uh, old fashioned uh, conventional spherical lens like the sensor, which has a uh, positive spherical aberration tends to neutralize, but I think uh, your thought process of putting it in a zero A spherical lens is a good way to go. You yeah, feel that. I, and I think the positive spherical aberration lens is good, but many of these hyperopic LASIK guys actually don't have much <coughs> negative spherical aberration of the cornea, either, and they may actually have some positive. On the other hand, if you put in a lens like you're just suggesting, um, and they did have a little end up with some positive spherical aberration in the eye, they may give them a little extended depth of focus too. So I, I don't think it's a big deal, quite honestly. I don't think it matters all that much. Um, yeah. This question is from Florida, and you did uh, mention about it. Uh, uh, any inputs or thoughts on the new Veracity program? I'm actually, uh, in India, we're uh, totally new to this. Uh, you did talk about it during a talk. I, I've heard, P I don't have it yet, because it has just been implemented for the Epic Medical Record, which is what we have. And we're trying to get, trying to, uh, to get it, I hope to get it soon. It's, uh, you know, people who have it love it because they can just, all the data gets fed into it. They don't have to have any printouts and <clears throat> there's no errors by transcription. You have all the formulas calculated automatically for you and it picks the eye well. And uh, it's, I think it's going to be, I think that kind of concept is going to, be what we all do in 15 or 20 years. We're not going to be taking paper and writing down, and it's going to be all automated for us. So you can feed data from multiple different instruments into the veracity, or it, yes, or it only with certain. Yeah, you can there. The, you can feed it in. I mean, from the IO Master, from the Lenstar, from the Argos, from the Galilei, from the Pentacam. Um, 
A lot of different devices, yeah. Uh, there's a tough question here. I mean, how do you calculate the IOL power in the most intact side? This is from Dr. Anil Kumar from Kampala. You know, I don't think we know um, how to calculate it. There have been so, so few, uh, we know those corneas are, are, are a bit prolate, which was what was interesting about the Intex process. Um, I think that would be one where I'd be interested in looking, trying to look at total corneal power. And I don't know how I would treat them. I mean, well, there's, the funny thing is that Intex, well, are, are, you, are they talking intacts after keratoconus? If it's yeah. after keratoconus, I probably just do my regular keratoconus calculations because the intacts are not going to change the, the sort of measurements. I, I probably just use the keratoconus formula or aim for a little myopia like I do in keratoconus anyway. Uh, no. uh, from Dr. Abdul Aziz from Kuala Lumpur wants to know how relevant accurate is SRK2 compared to the latest formulas? Ask that again, sorry? SRK2. I think it's something that should be given up. But, uh, oh, long, yeah. SR, SRK2 is, uh, should be placed in the historical file. Yeah, not, no value. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Usha from Pune wants to know about biometric methods in children one to five years. Oh, well, with children, when you're that young, we usually take them to the operating room and do uh, immersion. You know, we, get, we have an auto autocaratometer and we do immersion because it, almost always you can't get a measurement. Yep. Do you take average K values or actually measure the K value and incorporate that in the reading? We take the K values from the auto um that are measured at the time of the surgery and um, we don't attempt toric lenses in these kids. And there's a question from Dr. Diana from Shah Alam. Uh, how many years can the same biometric result be used after the first eye operation? I don't think we should reuse it. I mean, every time you go for a fresh biometry. Oh, when, how long can you use the biometry? Well, I mean, we That's right. any, any patient after about two months, we remeasure them again. Uh, I think that the vote brings us to the end of all the queries that have been around. I think some there are some others, but they have already been answered over the course of your presentation. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Cork. It's been wonderful having you. Great presentation and your patience to go through the entire set of queries and answer them to the best of your knowledge. And uh, I believe that uh, this would make a difference to the way we are doing biometry tomorrow in the clinic and enhancing the kind of results each one of us is getting. Thank you all for joining us and uh, really appreciate the delegates, not just from India, but all over uh, the world uh, participating in this session. And my sincere thanks to Johnson & Johnson for facilitating this. Thank you once again, Dr. Koch. Thanks, Dr. Ramavarthi. My pleasure, sir. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.